from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis on this kind of special day for us here on Chicago Newsroom. You know, Mayor Emanuel has about nine million dollars to spend on next year's election, depending on how you count it. And uh, when he beat Gary Chico and Miguel de Valle back in 2011, he got 326,000 of those 600,000 votes that were cast. So if the same patterns hold and he spends his whole campaign wad this time, that'll be about 27 bucks for everybody who votes for him. That's pretty serious walking around money, even in, even in Chicago. But um, I had this idea that maybe he could just mail you a check and we wouldn't have to watch all those idiotic TV commercials. That's a good way to spend the money. Anyway, if Jesus Chuy Garcia has his way, he's going to knock Rahm Emanuel off his perch with a lot less than $9 million. Mr. Garcia says Rahm Emanuel has further divided our city by race and by class, and he disagrees with the mayor's fiscal policies, policing policies, housing policies, education policies, and that's probably just the beginning. Steve Bogera is out uh, with a thing in the Reader this week about a uh, claim that uh, Garcia has a real shot at victory if he can put together a coalition of African Americans, Latinos, and those legendary if fading progressive whites. What Chuy Garcia clearly brings to the table is a lifetime of progressive politics at the neighborhood level in Chicago. And for those of us who can remember as far back as Harold Washington, we can recall that he was a vital part of that coalition. Now today, of course, he's a commissioner over at the Cook County Board, and he serves as Tony Preckwinkle's floor leader. And because we've got a very serious political discussion to have here today, we decided we needed, uh, you know, we got a guy who might be the next mayor of Chicago. We thought we'd better bring in a pro to help with the questioning. So Hal Dardick from the Tribune is back again. Hal, glad to have you here. And Mr. Garcia, welcome to Chicago Newsroom. Glad to have you here. Great to be with you, Ken. And you have brought along with you your wife, and we're very happy to have Evelyn uh, here with us today, too. This Thank is you. like, this is kind of like a first public appearance for you is a Thank joint you. appearance kind of thing, right? Well, I've been to numerous uh, ones already, so this is not my first. Okay, uh, well, I, I, mean, I love campaigning. You o do. Always have and yeah. continue as long as my husband is involved. Well, the first politics. interview. Like first this. interview. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. um, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. d uh, how do you feel about being the first lady of Chicago? Great. <laughs> You're just ready to, ready to I serve. I am. I, I have uh, a list of uh, things that I would like to see, uh, ch uh, you know, things that will work for the city of Chicago, so especially for children. To get, you know, halfway serious about it, mm -hmm. do you, would you see yourself as being a very activist, uh, yes. forward person out there in the, in the public eye? Yes. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So, welcome to Chicago Newsroom. Thank you. You think yeah. you can be mayor? I do. I think that my history and uh, my deep uh, roots and commitment to the neighborhoods uh, in Chicago uh, give me a resume and the wealth of experience uh, that can set the city on a different course. I think Chicago is a world-class city. I think Chicago can do better. And I think that people have experienced a certain uh, direction and uh, a thrust over the past four years that most people are not satisfied with. I want to uh, provide people with an alternative vision of where Chicago can head. I'd like to bring people together across the neighborhoods of the city of Chicago. My relationships span across ethnicity, race, faith, and I think that I can bring that case everywhere to the city of Chicago. I think the city has a work for a select few under this administration. I think the city should work for everyone in Chicago. And that's what I want to talk uh, to people about over the next three months as I make the case for regime change in the city of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talk <coughs> about your experience and certainly you've had a lot of important public offices. You were. Uh, on the city council when uh, Harold Washington was mayor, you're part of that coalition. First, uh, I think, Hispanic uh, state senator in the state of Illinois. Mexican-American state senator. Okay, yes. Mexican-American. And then uh, now you're the floor leader for Tony Perry. A lot of good, solid experience in the legislature. Mm -hmm. What kind of executive experience 
can you bring? Obviously, Mayor Emanuel came in having been, you know, chief of staff for a president and, and that kind of strong executive experience. What, what can you do? You know, it's a, it's a big bureaucracy, as mm -hmm. you know, and yes. you're well familiar with. What, would, what can you bring to that? Well, I, some of my management uh, experience includes uh, having run the city's uh, water department, the collection division that uh, collects water, uh, the fees from water for residents in the entire uh, city of Chicago for uh, two years. And then uh, more recently, uh, before joining the county board, I founded a, a, a nonprofit community development corporation known as Enlace. And I grew it from a one person staff myself to a staff when I left of 27 full time and 120 part time employees working in education, working in community safety, working to improve the quality of life, developing a long term plan for the community's development, and doing it working in conjunction with other community builders across Chicago, which gives me the understanding of challenges being faced by a, a variety of communities, mostly working class communities that span a Again, uh, the microcosm that Chicago is racially and ethnically and across faith lines. So I believe that those are real life experiences of how you build community under challenging circumstances. And that's what I would bring to, this, to the office of the mayor uh, in Chicago, not just my legislative experience in the three levels of government, but practical community building experience to figure out strategies for revitalizing especially the most hard hit communities in the city of Chicago. We are going to have to sort of jump around a lot here Let's today because there's so much to talk about. You mean you now. want shorter answers, Ken? Well, I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll do it. it, well, I, it the problem is that my questions are usually longer than the answers when I watch the tapes of the show. So, um, can we start with education? Let's start with education. Are you a product of Chicago Public Schools? Your kids? I uh, learned to speak English and read and write in a public school. Uh, and uh, I graduated from a Catholic elementary and a Catholic high school. However, uh, because of public education and the great University of Illinois at Chicago, I'm the first in my family to get a college degree. I'm also the first to have a master's degree, again, thanks to the University of Illinois. So I really value the role of public education. And you have three kids? I have three children. Did any of them attend CPS? Uh, yes, two of them, uh, well, actually two of them graduated from CPS. Okay, all right, so it's very hard to get a handle on the whole issue of schools and, and school policy, but let's just start with, um, the growth of charter schools in Chicago. Many people say that that is a kind of a privatization of the public school system. Uh, but in your community, in the in the Latino community, uh, charter schools have been very successful. Uno has a big operation, and there are others. Um, what is the relationship with charter schools to the public schools? Is it a good is it a good and beneficial relationship, or is it a negative relationship? The charter mania that began over 20 years ago has resulted in the creation, uh, the establishment of over 120 charter schools in the city of Chicago. Some of them do good work, most of them, the jury's still out. There's no case to be made to say that charters are superior to neighborhood schools. There has been a transfer of resources that are going into charters that would have gone to neighborhood schools that I'm very concerned about, especially if there's no case that show, no studies that show that charters are superior to neighborhood schools. Given that our education system is underfunded, I think this has had a detrimental uh, effect on public schools. I do understand why parents have signed their children up in charter schools because they think that, and they've been marketed heavily to think that it is a better alternative. I think some of them perhaps, you know, because they have dress codes and they have discipline codes and they're more selective in their enrollment of children is what may attract parents to them. But the record is clear, charters are not superior to neighborhood schools. We need to invest in neighborhood schools. If we don't invest in neighborhood schools, we're not providing children everywhere in the city of Chicago the opportunity 
to achieve their full potential. Would, would you stop the growth of charters? What would you do yes, about that? Yes, I think uh, we should have a moratorium on the expansion of charter schools. Uh, I think we need to invest in neighborhood schools and make neighborhood schools the center of community. They are existing assets and communities throughout Chicago that have the potential to do lots of things for students, for parents, and community members at large. We need to invest in making them. We did that in the Little Village community in seven schools in that community, as, long as, as well as investment in public safety, and we've begun to see many of the benefits of doing that. Of course, the mayor's already closed 50 uh, neighborhood schools. Would, would you reopen any of those? What would you do? And, and, and you've been very critical of that. I've also. been critical. Uh, I think we ought to look at uh, the utilization of these buildings as we move forward. Can some of them be reopened? Perhaps uh, we're taking a close look at that. I think uh, a lot of harm has been done, particularly because when those schools were closed, uh, young people and parents were told that most of their children would go to better schools, when in fact they haven't. The majority have wound up either in level three schools or level two, and only 21% in level one schools. A, a lot of the, the critics, of course, have said that uh, um, one easy solution to this is to uh, to go to an elected school board. Uh, there are plenty of people who think that that's probably not the right way to go. Where do you stand on an elected school board? I support an elected school board. I think it will ensure greater uh, transparency, more accountability. I think that if an elected school board had been in place, we would not have had the massive school closings in Chicago. The, the, the critics, though, of course, say that, that what will happen is that it will be politicized in a way that we've never seen before, that there'll be seats that'll be held by union people, there'll be seats that'll be held by charter operators, and, and it'll just become a big political battle. It won't be any more political than what it's been for the past uh, 20 years or so. I think uh, the chances for greater debate, for more transparency and accountability on the part of everyday people will be greater and enhanced. Yeah, the, the mayor says that you know you need to have someone in charge, and he's he's accountable. You don't think he's accountable? Sh Chicago is the only school district in Illinois. It doesn't have a school board. Uh, I don't think giving one person control over the lives of over 400,000 children is the way to go. I think trying something different would be good for Chicago. Well, related to that, of course, is the, is the issue of funding. And when you talk about funding, you can't go very far down that line without getting to this issue of pensions. And we have not yet seen the political leader who has the vision or the ability to begin to solve this pension issue. Um, are you that person? Will you be able to, will you be able to bring pensions into line in Chicago? There is no uh, easy solution. There's no panacea for addressing the pension crisis that we're facing in Illinois and in Chicago. It's going to take some serious, serious work, some deep analysis, and then some tough decisions to figure out the revenue side of it. However, it is related to what type of priorities do you have? Do you care about people? The Supreme Court will likely rule, it looks like because other courts have already ruled, that we need to keep our word to retirees and that we're mm -hmm. obligated to ensure that those commitments are fulfilled. So that will mean uh, coming back and figuring out revenue sides uh, to how we fund those pensions. It may also include restructuring of the pension obligations so that we can pay them over a longer period of time, but surely we're only here because of neglect and we've kicked the can down the road. Mm -hmm. so, so what, what revenue would, would you uh, propose to solve that? I mean, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Next year it's $550 million more than, than today. As you know, no one has come forth with a solution yet. Uh, we have a, a, a panel of experts looking at uh, pension uh, funding, at public school funding, and alternatives to it. We know that there will be some difficult medicines that will have to be uh, uh, swallowed, uh, but at the same time, we want to look at some sustainable sources of funding to pay the obligations that we owe uh, for uh, retirees currently, and then the retirees that will be coming in line as we move further down the road. Uh, you know, I believe that we need to look at some progressive-based uh, solutions uh, to this and not uh, do, you know, uh, short-term fixes uh, as has been done or simply postponing the payments. Can you, can you give me a couple of examples of, of 
progressive uh, funding solutions? Well, look, we're in this crisis in part because we have a regressive tax system in Illinois. Uh, we rely on property taxes to fund our schools, and that has drained money from us. Uh, for a long time and we haven't been able to fund education at the level that we need to not just in Chicago but, but across uh, Illinois. We need to move away from that. I think it needs to be a progressive formula so that people who make more contribute more as opposed to relying on regressive systems like the flat tax and the property tax to fund these things. I think that will be an important part of the mix of solutions as we move forward. P progressive income tax, is that what you're thinking? I, I like progressive income tax. I think they're fairer on people. It protects low income and it protects senior citizens. So something along those lines, I think, is somewhere in that realm where the solutions will be found. Well, Bob Fioretti, one of the other mayoral challengers, talks about a commuter tax. He talks about a Wall Street tax. What do you think of those two ideas? As I stated earlier, I'm not convinced that a commuter tax uh, may be the solution. Again, because I can't see taxing uh, people who are coming into the city to work from places like Blue Island and Midlothian, Cicero and Berwyn. I'm not sure that that is progressive uh, taxation. Uh, however, I'm open to uh, studying the various proposals that are out there. Th one of the concerns that I have about the stock transaction tax is its constitutionality, the fact that the state legislature would have to act on it in order for Chicago to have uh, that type of authority. And from the looks of it, if I read the uh, November 4th election results, we're not likely to see that type of an initiative approved in the General Assembly or by, this gov by the new governor. So you're saying then that it looks very grim for getting any kind of practical way of raising more money, but you support the, I, I think I heard you say that you support the retirees and, and their claims to their pensions and their benefits. So aren't we kind of in the same, the same quandary that we've been in for years and years and years? It's like you have the immovable object and the irresistible force kind of thing. No, I think that the crisis has uh, deepened uh, significantly. Uh, I think that it is a national problem. We're not alone in this. Uh, Illinois may be one of the worst states, and we may have one of the deepest crises uh, to, that's been experienced, but I think that because of this, there, it will call to attention on the part of leaders in both parties that we need to do something bold, something that we've never considered before in terms of figuring out the revenue side of things. We can't just you know, be saying we're against any type of tax. We need to be for progressive taxation because it has the fairest impact on all of society and it will help ensure the public good. Mayor Emanuel c constantly says that he doesn't want to provide revenue without reform. And by reforming, means changes to the pension systems where retirees would get less, uh, essentially. Uh, and he says everyone has to share the pain. Do you think that the retired folks should share some of the pain? You know, uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, medicine for everyone to have to swallow. But one thing I, I can tell you is that I don't agree with trickle-down economics. I don't believe necessarily in uh, austerity that affects poor people who are earning very modest uh, wages and uh, retirement benefits that they should bear the brunt of this. I think we need to be fair, we need to be equitable, and we need to be thoughtful about what is sustainable. And it's comments like that that I think demonstrate a certain amount of insensitivity to working people and to low income people. What about the minimum wage? Uh, Mayor Emanuel uh, came out the hero in this uh, minimum wage thing that went through the city council the other day, and now the state is backing away yeah. from it, and uh, you're seeing uh, people saying that this was a sop to uh, Mayor Emanuel, that Madigan did that to help Mayor Emanuel. Uh, he would seem like he'd be in a pretty popular position right about now. It was a good political move for the mayor, but I think it comes uh, late and it's too little. I think people see right through it. Uh, he only came around the minimum wage when the polls show him really sagging and uh, lacking uh, much support in the city of Chicago. It's great that he did, c that he did come around. I think $13 minimum wage is better than uh, the current minimum wage. However, it won't kick into effect until 2019. That would be at the end of a potential second term if he were elected. Unfortunately, I will interrupt uh, his tenure uh, during that time in office, but I think it's a, it's a step forward. I think that a living wage in this day and age is probably closer to $15. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead. And, and if I may, you talk about you're going to interrupt him, and, and you're mounting a challenge, and you've you've been deemed a credible challenger at this point, but you've raised so far, you know, less than a million dollars, not even close, I don't think, to that. Half a million. Half yeah. a okay, getting there. And <laughs> and so the mayor has three commercials up now on TV. He's got a robust website. He's got a, uh, a strong campaign staff at, at this point. Uh, you, you haven't raised as much money. You don't have any commercials up. I don't believe you have an official spokesperson or campaign manager at this point. How are you going to catch up to the mayor, given the fact you don't have his name recognition mm -hmm. throughout the city? And despite your ability to build a, a coalition, there's still a lot of people, I think, who don't necessarily remember the Harold Washington era that are, are younger than the folks <laughs> sitting at this table. How are you going to gain that momentum and mount a real challenge to this guy? Remember that I filed 63,000 petitions in three weeks, that I have half a million dollars in the bank uh, there today, and that our campaign uh, team will be together by week's end. Uh, remember that we're opening a, a West uh, Loop office and offices in the neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. Uh, yes, my name recognition isn't anywhere uh, where it needs to be. We're working on that. We don't need 10, 12, 14 million dollars like the mayor has because we're offering an alternative. We're offering a vision that will ensure that Chicago works for all of the people, for the 100 percent, not for the 1 percent that uh, he's come to be known uh, to represent uh, quite effectively. This is about uh, setting a new uh, set of priorities, about involving the neighborhoods. That's what people want in a mayor, and that's why I believe that in a three-month period, I will be able to muster the type of support and coalitional efforts across race, across ethnicity, across faith uh, to bring in a winner on February the 24th. At worst, I think we're headed for a runoff, and we'll be prepared uh, because after uh, February 24th, the reset button is hit, and then anything can happen. I well, you you already and, raised, and we expect to be able to raise enough money to get the message out to be on television, radio, and social media. And of course, we have a tremendous army uh, witnessed by the 1,000 circulators that circulated my petition without any pay mm -hmm. in a three-week period to file more signatures than the mayor did. Well, there is there is this aspect about. And I'm in, the only a, candidate who hasn't been challenged. In a, Even in the mayor's <laughs> petitions were challenged. In a, in a mayoral race, there is just only so much money that you can actually spend. I yes. mean, there are just only <laughs> so many TV yes. avails and on only so many, television. And only so many lies that you can tell about <laughs> how great things are. Well, people forget to, I, and this may be in your favor, but Jane Byrne raised, I think, $14 million uh, for her second run for Is office. Is that right? I didn't yeah, know. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, in a time when that was considerably wow. more money wow. than that is today, and obviously that didn't get a reelect. There's a lot of other dynamics yeah. there, yes. as we're all aware of. Well, yes. there, <laughs> one of the things that has been said over and over about your campaign is that you have strong and historic ties into the African American community, obviously through your time with Harold Washington and so forth. So it's raising optimism on the part of some people that you could be the second guy. You could be the guy who could put that coalition back together from the other side, from the from the Latino side, uh, and that you could put the you know you could put the band back together again and go out on the road again. We're, we're not putting, is that realistic? We're not putting the old band back together. This is the 21st century, the second mm -hmm. decade of the 21st century. This is the new Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take my campaign to Chicago's Jewish community, to the gay and lesbian community. I was out in the O'Hare region last night in Park Ridge talking to people affected by the noise at O'Hare. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. Those are Chicago neighborhoods. I'm in Southeast Chicago. I'm in Englewood. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm in Roseland. I'll be everywhere. I'm in, of course, the Southwest Side. You know, I was raised there, but I will be everywhere. That's you the new potential the of Chicago. Side. That's, That's right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Saint Rita High School. But I guess the, the 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 thing that I'm getting at is that we've talked about this a lot on the show. There is huge dissatisfaction with Rahm Emanuel. It is very fashionable to not like Rahm Emanuel. But what you're up against is when you get right down to somebody going into the booth and actually having to cast that vote, there's probably a lot more satisfaction with Rahm Emanuel than we, than we think, than shows up in polling. Because as I say, it's very, it's very cool to say to people, oh, Rahm Emanuel's a jerk, I, I don't like him. But when you come down to voting, are you gonna be able to be more 
what, more appealing to Chicagoans than Rahm Emanuel? I'm a neighborhoods guy. Mm -hmm. Someone who's worked and labored and proud of his neighborhood. Someone who enjoys going to other neighborhoods and learning how they work and what makes them tick. I represent the average person in the city of Chicago. I have the disposition to sit, to listen, to debate, to build consensus, and to lead, to treat people with respect, and to have the patience. I'm not seeking to be president. I'm not seeking to be governor or U.S. senator. I want to be the best be mayor that Chicago's had in the 21st century. I'm just going to. I'm just going to cut things. Were you going to say something? No. I'm going to cut something short here, just because I'm watching the clock. Um, we have not talked at all about crime and violence, and it's yes. it, 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 that's that's malfeasance on our part. Do we have enough police? We don't. Uh, the mayor promised to put 100, uh, 1,000 new cops on the street. Uh, he didn't keep his promise. We need to increase the number of police officers. But with that, we'll have to come real community policing, building relationships of trust and confidence so that people feel the ability to want to come forward and cooperate with the police. They're the real experts in their neighborhoods. They know where everything goes on. They know who the gangbangers are. They know who the drug dealers are. They know where the guns are unless they have the trust and the, and the confidence that their information will be handled with confidentiality unless police officers can establish relationships and know people in the neighborhood, uh, things won't get better. If you don't have good public safety and good solid schools in every neighborhood, you can't have a climate that produces jobs and local economic development in Chicago's neighborhoods. That's what we need. The fate of the neighborhoods should be intertwined with the fate of the central business district. That's how you build a great city. That's how you need to have great neighborhoods in order to be a world class and a great city like do, Chicago. Do you, have, do you have confidence in Gary McCarthy that he can do that, that, it, that he can lead that kind of police force? You know, uh, I think he had his own uh, track record and successes perhaps in where he came from, but I think uh, Chicago is different, and I'm not sure that you can just blame the police superintendent. He takes his orders from the mayor, and uh, we don't know exactly what orders he's gotten, but obviously the strategies that have been deployed thus far have not nipped the public safety problem in Chicago, and that's why we've earned the reputation as one of the most violent cities in, in the country. That needs to change. The, the mayor argues that over the, you know, there was that huge spike in crime early in his administration, that it's come down. He looks back at statistics, you know, back from the 60s, we have, you know, less murders than we've had since then. Of course, the population was about 700,000 people greater, so that maybe isn't like, the greatest comparison. But it, but, and I know some of the neighborhoods are still experiencing terrible levels of, of violence, but he says he's on the right track. Are we not on the right track? What, what would you do? Would you concentrate on those other neighborhoods? How would you change it? If one you, one, if, one you minute. if you ask people in the neighborhoods how they feel about public safety, they'll tell you that they have more concerns and more fear than in quite a long time. Uh, the adequate uh, police levels are required. We need to hire more cops and put them on the streets, but also community, genuine engagement of community residents is essential to have a working formula that will sustain the levels of violence at much lower rates. You have to have that occur. That's what's been missing. Community policing has been shelved at least for the past four years in Chicago. It needs to be brought back. Well, I guess is we're going to have to leave it, huh? Yeah, we, we could, we could we ask a lot more questions. <laughs> we burned that <laughs> half hour. <laughs> Evelyn, you just recently retired from Chicago Public Schools. Yes, I as did. A, as mm -hmm. a Chicago Public School yep. teacher. Well, so then. I'm a, a teacher assistant. Teacher assistant. Mm -hmm. So when you are first lady, you'll have a, a, an understanding of how things work at schools, won't you? Definitely. They Thank you both funded. very much for being here today. Thank I you. really appreciate uh, you spending some time with the little show. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We will uh, obviously be talking about this more, and I hope uh, when you're mayor, you'll come back, drop by Can TV oh, once will. in a while, okay? Visit our alma mater. Here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. All right. You have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. We really want to uh, thank Chewy Jesus, Jesus, Chewy Mayor Garcia, <laughs> and Evelyn Garcia, and of course Hal Dardick for being here. I'm Ken Davis. Check us out on iTunes. Right here, you can get it. You can watch the show anytime you want. Thanks for watching us. We'll see you back here next week with another show.